Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Celtic Down Under podcast, uh, the weekend review, hosted by myself, Sean, and I'm joined by, as usual, by my West Australian compatriots, Anthony and Paul. How are you guys doing, Anthony? Very well, Sean. Um, I lasted till 10 o'clock last night and fell asleep, so I didn't actually get to watch the game live. The red wine for dinner struck. Um, <clears throat> the game was a 10.30 kickoff here in Perth last night. Um, so woke up this morning to very welcome news and somehow managed to sneak in watching 100 minutes of football in between dispensing prescriptions and injecting and doing all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, other than that, yeah, a good weekend and, yeah, good uh, good result to cap it off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, Paul, how are you? Yeah, good. Tired, because I did manage to. <laughs> to stay up, I uh, I tactically only had a couple of beers uh, with dinner, uh, and then stopped, and sort of was start threatening to nod off in that sort of forty five minutes before kickoff. But yeah, made it through, and then yeah, the game was entertaining enough to you know hold my attention through through the other sort of hundred or so minutes. And yeah, yeah but- sometime sometime near half past midnight before uh, before it was time to turn in. So. Um, Work was a bit of a challenge, late, especially mid to late afternoon, but uh, we made it. Yeah, it, once it gets to this kind of, once the clocks change in Scotland, it gets a little bit more challenging, right? So like a nine, what was a 9.30 before and it becomes a 10.30 and you need to be quite tactical with like, because the games aren't going to finish till like 12.30 in the morning and 1 a.m. if you want to stay up and watch Chris Boyd crying. Uh, so yeah, I'd had a, a tactical nap during the day to, to get me through it, but yeah bit buggered now as a result as you say um but yeah it was and also as you mentioned paul it was an entertaining game albeit there were actually really long spells that were not so so engaging um like i've got like pretty much for really the last 20 minutes of the first half very few i've got actual no nothing of note really um other than a couple of just kind of tactical notes, but nothing uh, eventful. And even in the second half, up until the, the penalty shout, again, I've, the only thing that I've got between the start of the second half and the penalty shout is the that Rubizic, um uh, head head knock. Whatever, let's, we'll, we'll talk about that anyway uh, on Kyogo. Uh, so, so I do feel there was large spells where the game was quite pedestrian, um, but when, as you said, there was, it, there was large periods of concentrated excitement in particular the first 15 and the last how would you describe it the last 25 you know the last from the 75th to the 100th minute was quite entertaining uh which again was probably quite predictable in hindsight and in foresight uh given that Aberdeen had their European away trip on the Thursday night and ours is on the Tuesday and by all accounts uh of what we've seen and what we heard they put in more of a shift in Europe than we did this week so or last week, I should say. But yeah, um, but yeah, apart from that, you're right. What there was a lot of entertainment. Uh, Anthony, what notes? So the, the guys on the, the pod, the guys have already kind of uh, they, they did a fairly lengthy show and the, the, talking about various things. So they didn't go into uh, as much depth. They focus more on the players. So so what what have you got in terms of notes for the match, Anthony? I haven't watched it today. <clears throat> we'll start off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> started the game very well, so intensity was there from the from the off. So we really sort of took Aberdeen on the to put them on the back foot. They set up defensively, five at the back, four in front of them. Uh, Duke wasn't starting, which I thought was quite telling. Um, and yeah, we just really pinned them back. I, you know, Chris Sutton was making the point that they were trying to block the middle of the ground so that we were, they were forcing us wide. But as it turned out, Palmer and Yang probably had, arguably, you could say probably their best games in a Celtic shirt. You know, you know, up to the best performances that they've had because they were just every time one of them latched onto the ball, you felt like something was was going to happen. Um, and it didn't take too long before the two of them linked up um, for the first goal. Um, yeah, it's just you know, I think you know, Robson probably got his tactics wrong he sort of gave up too much of the park and too much you know mm. gave us too much sort of um, respect um and obviously we were 2-0 very early doors and obviously he realized that after you know i had to change it at half time or try to change it at half time but that was their fifth away game in a row if you count the cup game and the european games away so they've had a they're on the end of a pretty heavy run of fixtures so 
I think what you were alluding to earlier, Sean, there is it's not that surprising, which it's probably not. They haven't got the squads big enough to deal with playing in Europe midweek and then backing it up, especially like a Thursday night fixture. Although playing on the Sunday, it's still only a couple of days rest. So um, <clears throat> you obviously change the back line to try and shore it up. But the problem with that is when you make those sorts of changes is you need a bit of time on the training part to sort of bed that in. And that's usually when Celtic have the some of the more challenging games when teams have got one to two weeks to prepare for playing against Celtic. And you can see that the defensively teams in Scotland can be quite well drilled. But the fact that they're on the back of playing Pauk on Thursday night, you know, Robson didn't have much time. And I think that played a part. I think we played really well. Like we really ground them down early, early on. But, you know, it's partly they weren't as prepared as some teams usually are. And the fact that, like I said, we started really, really well and and, and got into it. <clears throat> Obviously, Kilroy comes off in the second half. Um, we'll touch on that a bit later. But then, you know, that gives O an opportunity. And I thought he looked he looked quite good when he came on and obviously gets his two goals. Um, you know, Tumble pops up with another one just to, <laughs> just to sort of remind us all that, you know, he's got that ability in him. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a good day at the office. But... I suppose, like you say, Sean, you're right. There was periods of the game, particularly I thought I felt that first, what was it, 25 minutes in the second half where not, not a lot really did happen. Um, so that, the one thing, I knew the score, but I didn't know when the goal, I didn't know, I didn't check to see when the goals were going to be scored. So at least that was going to be a surprise for me as I was watching the game. So I was trying to watch it as possible um, at work. But um, but yeah, but like I said, yeah, in the end, it was a bit of a flurry and yeah, it ends up 6-0. But I think you can argue the scoreline because comprehensively Aberdeen, you know, had that one sort of flick on chance with the Milovsky up front, but really didn't create anything of note that I can remember. So pretty, pretty comprehensive. And yeah, it was a good a good day at the office. Yeah, the stats at half time had them down for two shots at goal. And I was like, and I was trying to think of where to oh, say Johnny, 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 Hay Johnny Hayes. Johnny Hayes sclaffed wide was, was one, but I think that's the only and, one I could think of. The other one, I think, was uh, there was a deflection in midfield off Graham Shinney that ended up at Joe Hart. And that's the only right. other one I could think of that I was like, because when it happened, I was like, are they going to count that as a shot? And then it came about half time, two shots. I was like, they must have counted that as a shot. Uh, and, and to your point, Anthony, about the, the organization and the tiredness, uh, I, I actually had that down as a note in the first five minutes uh, was that their back line was not straight, uh, that their fullbacks were. Uh, be, getting, getting caught out of position, and I was like, "We are going to, we're going to make, we're going to make it take advantage of this. We're going to get these runs in behind because Matt O'Reilly, straight from the off, was running those channels really well. Yang was was hitting the byline really well. Uh, we were getting good combinations from even Alistair Johnson at the second goal. If you look at the run Alistair Johnson makes, that opens it up the 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 run for Matt O'Reilly in behind uh, for Yang to find him. So the there was some really good combinations down that side. And then Palma, like Greg Taylor wasn't doing nothing over there. Palma was pretty much two not on his own in that side. But we were uh, being quite effective on both wings, uh, which was which was pleasing to see because quite often you only get uh, one side. Sorry, uh, Paul, uh, can you come in and give us your take? Well, I, yeah, I guess the first thing you know, take a, let's take a step back the you know the team lines come out and um you know home start and yang start and i think most people were pleased to see that you know there's been a few did, calls did for... you see the comments after the match about odin uh from rogers by sorry by rogers no yeah. i think just he said it was a good he thought it was a good time for him to go in or was that his pre-match pre pre yeah, after match he basically bagged him after the match and said look if you're not going to do it you he, said he, did, he wasn't doing it so we hooked him we told him at half time you know you're not doing it you're going to be coming off so yeah he basically said I, he, he had your chance he didn't take it i thought he played okay to be honest um he, he probably didn't like put it like this he didn't he didn't dominate but t tactically and technically other than turnbull's finish he offered a lot more than than David Turnbull. I like, I'm gonna we might as well we're, we're talking. There's there's a comparison. That's his replacement. Like Turnbull until he scored had an absolute shocker. He couldn't trap a bag of cement. His first touch was awful. He was ponderous. He got caught in possession. Even his passing, which is usually solid, was short or long. It was just off target. And you're really going, what is he doing? 
And then typical David Turnbull, he's a total enigma. I tweeted this earlier on something, you know, I think it was it was Laura Bradburn actually was saying, you know, hats off to David Turnbull. He's done it again. He's reminding people what he does. But that's all, you know, it, it kind of sounds ridiculous. That's all he does. Scores goals from outside the box, which is great. Um, it's great. It's great the other week when it's up at Dingwall and it, it's the it's the deadlock breaker. To me, it doesn't make much odds at four 0 right? You know, it's just adding to his stats. We've talked about him fluffing his stats when when games are already done. He did a lot of that last season. He was Joint, he's Joint massively top scorer. He, top scorer in the league. Yeah, he's massively frustrating though, right? He, he honestly he did he did next to like really nothing, and then he does what he can do is which he, he you know he, he guides he guides one right in the bottom corner. Um, another easy, another easy assist for Palmer. He just knocks it in, and you know, this Aberdeen stood off him, didn't, didn't they? And and again, he picks start spot. It's very accurate. But is it enough? You know, is he going to get more serious game time, putting in those kind of performances? Like literally, no quality contribution until the goal. So, I don't know. I I, I think there's a place for it in against the low block up at Dingwall, that sort of thing, and a place for it, you know, as as games are petering out like that one. But he's not somebody to me. He's not somebody you're going to rely on in a game in in those attacking eight ten positions. He just for me he, he isn't, and you know some people will argue with that. But I, I'll make I mean, a point. It's on very what, interesting to see. It's very interesting to see what happens in January because I think he he should probably be gone so we can get some yeah. kind of feed for him. But. We'll just, just on what you've said, and it, you've made me think of this, what you've been saying, right, is that game would have been, I think, would have worked for, for Odin and for Turnbull, would have worked better yesterday with Turnbull starting and Odin coming on. I think you would have seen better from both of them because Aberdeen were so, so, so deep. Like, I, I was, it was shot. Even though I'm so used to seeing the low block, it was still shockingly deep, like, from the first 10 seconds of the game. I was, like, stunned. And, um, yeah, they didn't I really offer anything. That, they, like they sat that, deeper than a lot of yeah. other teams that come come, and and they and, and even teams that's offered they sit deep will usually come out and press a little bit. They didn't really off, even offer no, that until nothing. until half time they got a rocket and really apart from a, a, a bit, you know we can say it was a more aggressive press. It was just more aggressive generally. They started putting the boot mm -hmm. in. You know, they were there's you know you go right through that second half. There's a few players that are lucky to stay like definitely lucky to avoid a yellow and potentially to walk um and to me that was the only real change in their in their philosophy which was to to press us more aggressively but equally you know leave a boot in here and there as well yep yep i totally agree yeah and yeah i, I do i agree with what you're saying there that was pretty much it wasn't it um i don't did they even have a shot in the second half one i think just a little cut, just a little maybe the, flick, the Bivovsky <laughs> flick that kind of i don't think it's even on target but it's you know Joe Hart makes Joe a save, Hart saved it. And, yeah. and um, I think there's a player coming in at the far post that if he doesn't save it, then there's a tap in. But that's as close as it got, I think. Um, and yeah, the one in the first half with with Hayes again shows how simple knock over the top, and we are in trouble. Happened again, again. Defense got drifted. It was scales his head. It went over, even though it was in the right centre back channel. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just a pretty simple ball over the top and quite slow in the turning. Scales was uh, Scales was singled out by uh, Rogers after the match for praise as well. Um, I thought he did well. I didn't. Really I thought he was. I thought he was, was, there wasn't much defending to do, right? I thought he was good on the deck. His passing was okay. There was a couple of times he was a bit stuttery, um, and the fact that he is a natural left-sided player kind of helped him out because he, mm -hmm. you know, we saw that last season when you know a right-footed player, whether it was Starfelt or somebody else, was on that side and they got pressed. They sort of had to. You know, hook it around the corner with a right foot. He was a bit more um, composed because it was his natural side. But when they did put a bit more pressure and, and press on in the second half, you know, he, they, he did okay. There was one point he actually he played through the press quite nicely. I think he exchanged a one-two and beat a player and then knocked it in. Um, but he didn't have a lot to do defense. There was a couple of good blocks on the edge, in the, like on the edge of the eighteen-yard line. Um, but first half again we've got problems when the center backs are asked to be the main dictators of play when teams sit deep kyogo made a couple of brilliant runs like from really deep diagonals coming from outside to inside and scales was usually the player that had the ball and he just either didn't see it or didn't fancy himself to execute it mm -hmm. um 
and and again there's a couple of points um with cross fields from from Cameron Carter Vickers' side Palmer looking to do the same like come off the wing and sneak in behind the fullback and again there wasn't the ability there either to see it or, or execute it so um I guess we really want a, a, one of the midfielders to be the player that's on the ball when those things are starting to open up um but obviously for you know teams target Carl and I don't think he was overly targeted. Certainly, his first half yesterday, he had basically the freedom of the place, uh, and we—that's the thing—we were able to pick passes both centrally, up the middle, and you know, picking out wings and interplay, and and yeah, to the point that you guys have made, both both Palmer and Yang were excellent. I thought Yang obviously started really well. He had he had a, a good bit of wing play early on, and you know, the deflection, the good pass in, but it deflected into Kyogo's path. He should score. And O'Reilly should score the follow-up. So mm -hmm. we were, yeah, that was even before his one. Um, and, and there was a point in the middle of that half where after he got his goal, he just got a wee bit overexcited and he was sort of trying to beat players two and three times. And he's just like, you know, it, 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 you get it, there's a bit of nervous energy and excitement. But he, if he can just channel, because he's got he's clearly got ability to take a man on and, and see a pass. So if he can just, you know, I expect Rogers and Harry Kuehl probably be spending a lot of time on, on the training pitch with him and you know, potentially, you know, trying to cut down his, you know, or work on his decision making because th there's clearly talent there. And then on the other side, I think the one the, the thing that was quite exciting for me with with Palmer was, and we saw a little cameo of it um, up at Dingwall for for Jamesy Forrest's goal, is that ability to go in the outside and play a left footed cross because one of the things that this major grievance with the fan base up until this point is really being, he's too one paced, he can't beat a man, and he always cuts inside on his right. Well that game's kind of showing you that that's not necessarily the case and even when he is on his right he's played two killer pa passes with the outside of his boot um the chance for home which i think it's a really great like that's that's a really good skill to take it on the volley from that cross you know that little dinked cross and, thing, and it's a good save uh, by ruse um and he had a good save just after that from Palmer as well um albeit some of his other goalkeeping was a little bit suspect to say the least um especially his kicking like kicking in straight into touch three or four times is dreadful and he's obviously posted missing at the at the opener for the i don't know if he just loses it in flight or yeah but um but yeah palmer palmer's now showing you know we knew he could strike a ball and we knew he can pass but he's now sort of causing issues because now now defenders don't know if he's going to go inside or outside and that that will cause defenders a, a world of pain so i i do i be like oh and again but like Rogers was very specific and broad uh, in, in terms of his feedback on his individual players after the match, uh, quite unusually so. And again, Palma was another one that, that got caught for very specific feedback. Uh, and what he'd, what Rogers had said after the match that I, I do agree with and had observed it uh, was that, you know, in the early days, Palma was very too safe almost, like he was always playing it back and turning in. Uh, and he was, he, he, Rogers is making the point, but that now he's got much more unpredictability to his game. That he can go back, he can turn outside, hit the byline. He can cross with his left. He can cross with outside his right. Which and he did both. That you know the the goal, the angle was across with his left foot. There was who was the yeah. one last week or the week before where he hit some of the left foot, James Forrest. James Forrest, uh, and then the one where he uses the outside of his right to find O. Everyone. Yeah. It's everyone is flat footed from that because everyone's mm. expecting him to to take a another take a run on. Even always flat footed. It, it just so it's happens the same. It, it yeah, fell on the always head. head. So like, but it's it's, really... it's it's pretty much identical, only if he's done it from further out than the one with to home in the first half. Like he's that's the same flick off the outside of the mm. boot. Um it's not over and behind the defense, it's in front of it, but <sighs> but obviously home sees it and and as I say, it was a pretty good, a pretty difficult skill to catch that on the volley and keep it under the bar, which he managed. But yeah, it's it's pretty. I think there's a lot more to come from Palmer, and he's clearly shown, even when he was being more cautious, that he can retain possession. He's, you know, he's, he's. I'm sure it's. I don't know what his passing percentages are like, but I, I bet they're pretty high. Because to your point, he'll, you know, if it's not on, then he's happy to come back and recycle and and sort of move it again and obviously that's what Rogers is keen on as well but now he's got that extra little drop the shoulder and go on the outside or or the inside you know the outside of the right foot and kind of it's definitely going to challenge some defenders Anthony comments on the wingers <clears throat> well he's shaping up to be probably our best signing of the season um on 
you know, what we've seen so far and <clears throat> the sharp sort of curve in his performances. Um, the fact that he can kick the ball with both feet as a winger, <clears throat> that would you know, put the fear into you as a fullback because you don't know what way he's going to go. And obviously early doors, I, you know, you're quite right. And Rogers did say that, that, you know, he was, he was, t- he was always cutting back in every time. Um, but now that he's starting to get to the byline and whipping some of those balls in, and all of a sudden, Hyogre looks more dangerous again. You know, oh, Yang, you know, people are getting in there. And there's one in the second half where three players all made the same run for the for the ball. Where they all went middle post when if somebody had been back stick, well. they, would, they, they, would, they would have stored. Mm-hmm. Forrest probably should have hung back because that was his, that he was on that wing and he cut yeah. in into the middle and got in the road of someone else. Um, so, and that that outside of the foot cross for for the the O's goal. I mean, talk about putting on a postage stamp. I mean, literally, O just had to sort of stick his head out, and I mean, still finished it well. But like, you can't, as far as service goes, you don't get mm-hmm. any better than that. I mean, it is a factor that the Aberdeen fullback was way too far off him, but he still had the technical ability to whip that ball in with the outside of his right foot. And the boy can hit a penalty as well because I know mm-hmm. he did the whole sight the keeper out thing, but the keeper was never getting that penalty anyway. Like it was one of those ones where it was covering it at the side net and keepers aren't going to save those. So it looks like he could be a hopefully be a penalty taker, thank God. Um as for Yang, Rogers said as well, he said that they'd be working on him to try and get him just to you know, he can obviously beat a man, but to try and get him to either cut back inside or lay the ball off. And as Paul said, he's he's clearly got the ability to do it. It's not that he doesn't know how to do it. He does know how to do it. It comes back to decision-making and deciding when, yeah, I'm going to beat my man, get the cross in, or as for the second goal, slip it into the path of Matt O'Reilly. Um, and then, like I said, he it was like that was a reminiscent goal of previous seasons where, you know, the inside channel cut it back and Kyogre's, you know, you're thinking, what? How's he going to score this? Is he going to back heel it, whatever? And he ends up using his left foot and sort of tapping it past throughs. Um, so yeah, good day at the office for both wingers. Um, to back to Paul's point with David Turnbull um, and uh, and home, obviously that centre midfield berth is it's wide open at the moment because obviously Tati's injured. He's going to be injured for a while yet. We've got a run of fixtures coming up, obviously into the new year. Um, so it's some European games to go. Um, it's anybody's position, basically. I mean, so, you know, I may as well talk about the candidates. Obviously, Home got the nod last night, and I, I didn't see the comments that you were referring to there, Sean. But you know, if he has said that, then that's probably, you know, he's, he's probably bumped down the pecking order all of a sudden. Um, but to, to Paul's point, it's one of those games where it probably didn't lend itself to Home's strengths. He's one of those players that likes to get involved, win the ball back, recycle possession, and Let's face it, Aberdeen were just humping it. It was coming straight back anyway. So it probably wasn't really his game per se. Um, you know, Bernardo, obviously, he's played a few games. So, you know, I understand him dropping, dropping out. And then Turnbull, you know, one paced. You know, I, when you're up against it, is he the guy you want in your centre mid? I don't think so. I think when you're creaming it and you're 2 3 0 up at Celtic Park and you want to rub, you know, you want to pile on the misery, yeah, bring on David Turnbull or. You know, if you're a stodgy, or if it's a stodgy nothing each up at Dingwall when you're there's 25 minutes to go and you're looking for some a bit of a deadlock breaker, then yeah, bring him on. Like I, I there's a there's a spot in the squad for David Turnbull. It's just not as a star. But is he gonna be happy with that? Is he has does he have aspirations to play for Scotland? Well, he's not gonna play for Scotland if he's warming the bench for Celtic. So he has a decision to make. Like I said, I don't think he's the answer, but you know, does he could he have a role within the squad? Yeah, I, I I think so. Like you know, he's if he was doing what he was doing for other teams in Scotland, there'd be there'd be people out going, "Why are we not signing him? He's a Scottish player." Blah blah. blah which is kind of what we did because he did it for Motherwell. He's just not question really though, that question, name. Anthony. Right? It's all your absolute valid points. Do you think he'd even be still in the team now, as in on our books and not sold if he wasn't Scottish? Probably not, but unfortunately, they don't grow grow on trees. And the the last two that were available were Lewis Ferguson and. Aaron Hickey, <clears throat> we let both of them go. 
Josh um, Doig. And Doig. And Doig, and Doig, yeah. Doig and you know, and then you know, obviously you know, further back. You know, when we John need a left King. back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. We'll get to that. Um, so obviously that position is up for grabs. And the only other, th- the only other thing, I w- the other point I want to make on that is that the other glaring option there, if none of those three are your man, would be push Callum McGregor in the eight and put Awata in at the, the holding six. I think Awata is Rolls Royce. I, I, I think he's got the physicality that we sometimes lack. He's comfortable on the ball. He doesn't give it away much. So, I mean, for me, you put him in at six, you push Callum McGregor up a bit and get him you know, more involved, like picking the ball up in, in you know, positions further up the park. Get him doing what he's, you know, he's got the creative talent to do it, break, run, make those runs and break the lines. So I think that's, you know, if, if Rogers has cycled through Turnbull, um, home and Bernardo and he can't make his mind up, then surely that's got to be your, your other option. You at least have a look at it. He and had a, he, well, I, you, sorry, on you go. No, no, I was going to say, yeah, I, 20, I, yeah, I, tw- I, yeah, a really good 20 minute cameo. The downside to that is the game's done, right? He looked, he, he looked really sort of, Competence probably a bit, a bit harsh. He looked he looked good, like and he, he didn't have much pressure on him. But there was a bit of aggressiveness, and he was he shrugged players off. His link up play was neat and tidy. Um, I agree with you. It, it, as long as Hatati's out, no one else uh, is really putting a stamp on that. So then there's a rotation. There's a rotation potential there, and you know maybe that's maybe that's it. But the problem, I think, that one of the big problems we've got is because there's no obvious candidate. There's all this chopping and changing. It's 50 minutes here. It's half an hour here. It's 70 minutes here. It's 20 odd minutes there. Is that going to be enough to give anyone, to get, or even to give, you know, Brendan Rodgers the, the confidence to go, oh, when we go to Rome, I'm definitely going to play these midfield three. Do, do you know what I mean? I think that's the concern. Like that to me, like obviously there's games, there's games before then, but that that's a pretty massive game. Palm will be a massive miss. Obviously, it now looks like Yang will probably nail down one wing, but. I worry about you know what we're going to do with the other one. Um, uh, well, so Cal McGregor is going to probably play like 150 minutes for Scotland this week. So there's a good chance that Awata starts against Marbell at home uh, mm. in our next game. Uh, but yeah, I agree with what you're saying about Awata looking. But I also just want to because uh, there was some commenters on the the pot noodle earlier that said that Cal Mac had a bad game, and I just and the guys didn't didn't agree but also didn't disagree and I just want to shout that down right now I thought Carl Mack had a good game uh I thought in the first it was like half, one or two missed there's one or two misplaced passes but you know I thought he was yeah, in that spell so the, first, the first half hour the second half when Aberdeen stepped up the pressure or whatever we're calling it right like he was the one he was the best player in that spell like he was the one that kept the game calm when Aberdeen were trying to turn it into a, like a you know a physical battle rather than a football game uh, and he was the one that kept ahead. And then, right, like outside of that, he didn't stand out because his main job is recycling the ball, which is like to do efficiently is not, it like, looks simple and is unspectacular, but is, is very important and something that someone like Holm was not doing successfully. So it's, it's, you can say it's simple and Iwata looks like he can do it as well, but it's also something you have to be able to do very, very efficiently to, to do that role. And, yet, and, I think and, teams, was, and if teams target you and shut you down, like wait, on the times that, Cal has been shut down and targeted you notice how big a miss it like when he can't get on the ball that simple recycling suddenly isn't so mm-hmm. bloody simple anymore like he says exactly. Sean, like yeah. if you can't get the ball moving through the midfield or out to the wings and you know it gets stifled and it's just gone back to the centre backs and the goalkeeper or the full backs then you, you've got a massive issue um, just while we're talking about home like there's a, there's a bit of, there's a bit of dialogue out there that people think that home's best position might ultimately end up being that six um so but i heard some other comments i think you know maybe roger say pre-match that he's he's not quite got the physique at the moment for what he mm. thinks a midfielder in scotland needs and you know he I, needs to build that side up as well as obviously game time i mean what you the point you made earlier was very valid about the against the low block then suit him right and because your touch has to be in your depth of your weight of pass has to be just be spot on that's just that's just what it calls for right like if you're going to break that down that's what you need to be able to do and holmes touch was off yesterday do you know what i mean he was making his runs fine his runs were good but um his, his touch was just bad like but then he hasn't really had much game time either and this is this is part of the problem this talks back to the problem of rotating players through positions and and he's not really had a look in for the last little while and 
you expect them just to hit the ground running the minute they start. And and sometimes some players need a bit of time to warm up. And well, it's, Yang? it's well, but he, he's been getting, cam- he's been getting cameos. Well, yeah, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. He started like a he started like a steam train with the with the assist for O'Reilly up in Aberdeen, and then you know we all thought he was gonna that was him. He was up up and running, and then he had a few games where he flattered to deceive, and there was a couple of nice bits of skill. But no end, we, we spoke we spoke a lot about no end product, you know, whether it was mm-hmm. domestically or otherwise. Um, and then yeah, he's just start like they're young players, and they're just they're a you know a massive club, new country. Um, it's, there's going to be some bed in, t- in time, both professionally and personally. So that's the thing we, we as fans, we all forget that you know they're they're just they're just people as well. <laughs> like they've got all the usual shit that the rest of us are dealing with, and they're trying to perform in front mm-hmm. of sixty thousand in a stadium and millions around the world with their hopes and dreams on their shoulders. So um, yeah, I, I, like I touched on it earlier, and I said it again, like it's just that thing of with that one birth that's not clear with Hitati out. And it's a bit like the wings as well, I guess. But you haven't got an obvious standout candidate. So until one comes to the four, or maybe it's a bit horses for courses, you know, you you use the right player at the right time. They're not really going to be absolutely firing on all cylinders because they're not going to be one. They're not going to be fully match sharp because they've not really got the minutes in the legs, and they've they've also not got a run of games either to be to have that confidence and pomp, right? You know, up and at them mm. kind of thing. So. Yeah, it's challenging, but I guess as we go through this period, you know, you have times like this when players are get injured and the squad's tested. And at this point, like it's a great, like it's a great result and and performance given the circumstances. You know, I mean, we come back off off a of hiding. Mm-hmm. You know, Aberdeen on paper, one of the stronger sides. Yes, you know, they come off a, a European trip and not much turn around. And I, you know, I did say on another show that I fully expected us to right the wrongs of Tuesday and and come out and put a statement defining performance and result together and that's what that's ultimately what happened but it's just because that's what i expected and and it happened didn't mean you know there's, there's plenty of other ways that game could have gone you know we this if they start quickly and they get something to hang on to or we get a bad decision and suddenly you know the crowd gets against the you know turn and it could have been a tough afternoon Let, let's so be it's frank just right? good to take these, just always, good to take these off it's always amazing when sevco drop points but if they drop points to Aberdeen in the in the next game, which they play each other up in up in mm, uh, up in the north coast in the, in the very next game, and if Aberdeen takes something off them after Chris Boyd had that rant about Aberdeen lying down to Celtic, uh, that's going to be sweeter than any drop points that they normally get. Uh, I'll probably touch myself if that happens. Um, See, <laughs> just on the just on that comment that he made though, right? Um, I, I I saw that this morning, and obviously I hadn't seen the game. You see six 0 I didn't know when the goals were scored, so I'm thinking, all right, I'll part that to one side and watch the game. They Aberdeen didn't throw the towel in. I mean, the last five minutes they probably they probably did to an extent. Oh, the last ten minutes, until, I did. yeah. Up until then, they were they were sticking the boot in, like you know they were putting challenges in, you know. All right, they got the tactics wrong, but second half they came out and had a had a, some sort of a go. So you can't turn and say that oh they didn't try and they were terrible and all the rest of it. So they played them off the part. Sometimes you just have to appreciate that the team you're playing against just played really well. And I mean, somebody didn't play well for the whole hundred minutes, but they had spells within the game where they were pretty much unplayable. They were they were knocking the ball around that sort of zippy, fast flowing football that we love to watch Celtic play when they're in the full pomp. There's not any team in Scotland that can stop that. But mm-hmm. yeah, for him to make those comments, if I was Dave Cormack and um, you know, the the CEO um Alan Burrows and that, I'd definitely put a statement out today asking for an explanation because bag out of order. Monster Munch needs to pull his head in because that's just yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's not on. I mean, you're basically like saying team, teams team, team's team. It's just it's it's rubbish. Yeah, he's basically he's basically saying he's basically saying that yeah. You know, they, they haven't tried a leg and to, it just shows how dumb he is right a couple of things how, like he's given Barry does Barry Robinson now doesn't even need to do a team talk next game like you can put that up on the dressing room wall go out and show him if you needed to right they'll all be up for a game against them lot anyway because you know they raise and the, he made oh, they always raise a game against against Rangers well I've seen this float around on Twitter and it's absolutely spot on 
Rangers always let raise their game against us. It's just some teams raise the team against <laughs> a, what was deemed to be a rival or a bigger, better team. Like, their performances against some of the rest of the league is shocking. And then they come and have a pretty good performance against us now and again. More often than not, they'll get gobbed, but sometimes they'll get they'll run it close tight. And that's all that's happening between Aberdeen and Rangers. So, you know, it, it just it just stuff finds its level. Um, and uh, he's he, he's he can't talk about anything to do with that club with some of the stuff that's going on over there at the minute. That, I don't want to concentrate any time on it, but that that dive that VAR never reviewed is just and we've talked about VAR more than, well, the whole football world talks more about VAR in the last two or three well, weeks than... Let's, let's talk about Rubicic and that. Let's, mm, let's, where let's. Kyogo, Kyogo was unconscious on the pitch, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Willie Collin gives himself lots of time to decide. And he's even having a conversation in his earpiece with assistants and four officials, I presume, because you're not really, I don't think you're allowed to talk to VAR unless there's a review. Mm. So, what you know, like... Is that a clear red card? Is uh, should VAR be get involved? Should Willie Collin have called it in the first place? Well, are we believe in this? Sean Rooney, who's the ex Aberdeen player, came out and said what, he won the ball, not even a yellow card. Uh, obviously, he's still playing in 1982, as if winning the ball has any consideration these days and whether something is reckless and dangerous, right? So, Anthony, it's a red card in any other league but Scotland. Um, Clearly, that happened in a Champions League game. Well, we see what the threshold for um, reckless endangerment is. And Daisa Maeda got that red card, right, for that tackle. And we can debate that all day long. If that's the threshold in Europe, then I've absolutely no doubt in my mind that that is a red card all day long. But in Scotland, we seem to referee by a different different standard where, or oh, he didn't mean it, or he was going for the ball and all this. It doesn't matter. He's absolutely come through the back of Kyogo and he's absolutely smashed him. Um, sorry, red card for me. Kyogo, lights were out before he even hit the deck. <clears throat> he's come out and said that I don't remember anything. I don't remember, don't remember going down, don't remember players saying that you're okay. Trip to the hospital, like it took him a while to come come to, and now he's out of his um Japanese squad for this week because you know he can't can't make the can't make the travel because he's under a concussion watch. So um absolutely um yeah you, you can't do that in today's game i mean yeah you're right maybe in the 90s or the 80s or whatever but it's not today it's it's a, it's a red card and it's, it's reckless um yeah all right he was going for the ball great but he's followed through and absolutely smashed kyogo in the process i'm sorry but that's just yeah it's a red card Simple as the, that. the only and, thing i'll say in defense of the officials is when something like that happens in a game uh it, when you only get one view of it, it really does, like, it's really hard to tell um, sometimes if it's an accidental clash of heads. And in that case, like, you see in the replay, it wasn't, right? So for Willie Collin, there's a, there's, I, I get it, right? If it was me refereeing, I'd probably only give a yellow as well. So in that case, the question then is, is it clear and obvious enough for Vervar to get involved? And because it's a subjective thing, you could, there's almost an argument for him in nowadays, uh, domestically at least, that if it's subjective, then VAR just shouldn't be getting involved, and and that almost com- that almost comes out of the the game at Ibrooks, where you know the Ibrooks club wrote to the S- uh, SPFL or whatever complaining about why was VAR even getting involved if this is a subjective issue, right? So well, I, go, I, I go back to the I go back to the Maeda one, and VAR got involved in that. And but it's Europe. There's, the yellow cards. there's a there's a weird different standard at the moment between there's a different way that it's done VARs. The, the, the standard for clear and obvious at the moment in Europe is much lower than it is in Scotland. And this is the this is the. Well, I thought there was also a thing around around red cards and dangerous play that was different from clear and obvious. There's like if you pick up dangerous play that is, you know, it's deemed to be dangerous and therefore a red card offence, then it doesn't necessarily have to be clear and obvious. You can just point out that that's what's happened because, as you say, you've got more time to see it. You've got multiple angles, and the refs only had one. And I think that's what's. You know, we we argue the toss about the Mira one, and and you know, stand by. I think it's a ridiculous decision, but um, and the way it was positioned, obviously with the still and all of that. But uh, to to Anthony's point, the threshold, if that's the threshold for dangerous player and endangering an opponent, then this is way past that. And look, if, there's a lot of commentary about you know he win, he goes for the ball and he wins the ball, so. He yes, he goes doesn't the win the ball. He makes well, contact he, with the ball. <laughs> well, yeah. So he he does After go for the ball. Kyogo. 
Well, th- well, this is the thing, right? It, it, it's it's either just before Kyogo and then follows into Kyogo, or it's almost at the same time. But to me, that and and you know, you correct me if I'm wrong, but if we talked about if getting the you know contact in the ball isn't the key thing here. It's, it's whether irrelevant. you're endangering a player and yeah. you're in control. So if he's if he let's take the head thing out of it, because it seems to be a lot of like blur and all. It's it's a 50 50 head thing. It isn't. But if this was a slide and tackle. And a player gets the ball and then follows through with a forceful slide and takes some play in the shins. It's he's endangered and he's out of control and he's off the ground. He's endangered his opponent and it's still a red card. Right? Yeah, got the ball first or not? So to me, this is exactly the same. The big thing that isn't in his defence is he's looking at that from quite a few yards back. And Kyogo has got no idea he's coming, right? Obviously, he can expect that there's probably going to be a challenge. But to me, he basically lines it up. Yeah, he's targeting you. And the fact he's laughing and joking, he's laughing and joking when he only gets a yellow. And he's laughing and joking down at the corner with the fans, when the fans are booing him and stuff. His attitude is all wrong as far as I'm concerned. And I feel like he he knows he's got away with one. And he's he's done that old fashioned thing that he used to do in the first five minutes of a game. He's left one on somebody because um, the first one's free. And the other thing about this is the yellow's weird for me because either it's coming together, in which case it's not really foul play, or it's foul play. And if it's foul play, you've got to say that it's, he's endangered his opponent, in which case you're straight to a red to me. So yeah, they've made a bit of a mess of it. Um, and it's not really a huge surprise given what's been going on of late. Um, I'm just pleased that the wee man was able to get up. Um, has obviously been able to tweet out a message today and he's going to have the international break off, which is a shame for him. But obviously for his well-being and for our for our season longer term, it's it's that's all probably a good thing. You just hope that there's no sort of ongoing or permanent damage because, you know, these things can show up a lot a lot later. And I mean like days or weeks, but, but potentially years later when you get, you know, mm-hmm. an add-up of head knocks. It was right in the temple. It's pr- Sick enough to be like literally sick. And the amount of times yeah. that I showed the replay, you're just like, don't and, really and they, get that sometimes. Players get sent off in the NFL for that. Like it's called targeting a defensive, targeting a defenseless, defenseless player, and and you'll get sent off in the NFL, right? A sport that encourages well, Tom hard, hard Tom tackling. English. Tom English yeah, said that in card and rugby. Mm. So yeah, you know, and yeah, and if, and if, and. And everybody's yeah. going, well, there's no heading in rugby, so you don't know what you're talking about. But the point, he, and, and he, he was making a really good point, which was fallen mostly on deaf ears, and partly because the, the laws in our game don't protect players in the head to the same degree as they do in rugby. But in rugby these days, even though there's no heading of balls, the way that they they collide and make tackles, there's head-to-head contact all the time. And mm-hmm. whether it's intended or not, if there is any contact to the head, and we saw this a lot in the World Cup, any contact to the head, you're, you're a yellow as a bare minimum. And they're now doing that thing where they've got that eight minute review in the eight minutes of the 10 minutes in the sin bin to decide if it gets upgraded to a red. And that's obviously what happened in the World Cup final. Um, and then the All Blacks were, were, were shy of uh, their captain for, I think, 60, 65 minutes, 60, 65 mm-hmm. minutes of the game. Um, and probably the key key thing that, that, that sort of turned that game because they ran it pretty close with, with only 14 players. So I think there's a bigger discussion here about uh, player welfare um, and, and stuff around heads. Now, I, I'm a player who I used to love a header um, when I played. Um, certainly as a kid, I used to love getting involved in it. Um, so, you know, I don't want to see head and leave the game, but there's got to be some sort of responsibility on players when they go for the ball, that they are looking after their colleagues on on the pitch. Yeah, because it... duty of care, and he's he's yeah, targeting a... he's targeting the player, and that's that happens to Kyogo way too often. We've all played games against guys like that, right? It doesn't happen that often, luckily, but we've played against people that do that. I played against a guy once that uh, on the opposite team kicked the ball deliberately to me so that he could tackle me. Right, and that's, that, that's the sort of mentality we're talking about here from from Brez, Brozovic. Is that his name, right? Uh, like he's just uh, yeah, Rubovic, Rubovic, R- Sorry, Rubovic, not Rubovic. Yeah, Rubovic. Uh, quickly, one before we before we round up on the any in any before we run through our points that we may have left. Uh, just a quick one on the penalty. Uh, yes, no, just quickly, Anthony. Yeah, no, I was yeah, I was comfortable enough with that. 
I, I thought it was a penalty, and then you know, obviously we went to <clears throat> VAR for a look, but um, yeah, it was clumsy, and you can't you can't put a challenge like that in the box. And if he just had stood up, Yang was probably going to hit it wide. Sorry, O was going to hit it wide anyway. But he's he's given the referee a decision to make, or obviously not make, and then had to make when he looked at the monitor. But um, no, it was it was it's a it's a lazy, clumsy challenge for me. And yeah, when you do that in the box, it's a you're giving the referee a decision to make. So yeah, I, I you know I thought I, I, in first viewing I thought oh that looks like penalty to me, and then obviously nothing happened. I went oh far I'll have a look at that, and obviously got it on the overturn. So yeah, I, I, I would, if it was the other way around, you you couldn't really argue the toss with that. You'd say yeah that was a a, a bad yeah, a bad bad decision bad bad decision by the defender put that tackle in. Paul, I uh, <clears throat> I've got a bit of sympathy for Aberdeen on this one, um, only because. Always not impeded until after the shot's away, and and that's you know it's the play's de- dead at that point, um, and that's probably not the laws of the game, but like if he's fouled, if he, if that's in the act of shooting, Stonewaller, but the contact's way, way after he's made it, he's had his clapped his finish, then the foul comes, the ball's nearly out of play by the time the contact comes, so we're not there's no loot we're not losing out on anything there um i'd be pretty disappointed if that was given against us to be honest so um i thought i thought it was a bit of a soft one um it was what i would call a, a technical decision and and again these are the kind of things i think are kind of spoiling the game a wee bit like um a bit like some of the handball stuff going around um like any kind of contact with a hand in the box is now a penalty like no it shouldn't well there be. was there was a hand to ball, a ball to hand on the Aberdeen defender that wasn't given. Well, yeah, but it, it actually came off the Celtic player's hand first. No, yeah, I'm, not, the again, to, I'm, not, I'm not saying another. it should, not saying it should <laughs> yeah. have been a penalty. I'm just saying, like, you know. Yeah, no, I, and, and yeah, there was there was that, but like, the common sense is played there. It's it's a, it's a Celtic hand first, then an Aberdeen hand. So you go, well, mm-hmm. they, they cancel each other out or you know, play on. But the, but if, if you're going to see why the laws can... of the game strictly, there's actually a case that that was a penalty. Because the one where so it hits Palma's hand, right? But Palma's hit, kicked onto his own hand, which is not a handball offence. And when that player's on the ground, his the arm that's not supporting you is in an unnatural position. Exactly. Mm. That's so technically, if you want to be totally pedantic, right? I agree, it shouldn't have been a penalty. But mm. if you want to be to- totally pedantic, and if say for example that was a Sevco attacker, you're probably going to see a penalty awarded there, right? It's a rule yeah. that needs to be reviewed in the summer. Like they really you're, need you're right. to. They really need to try and limit it because the number of penalties and VAR decisions, because obviously in real in real time the referee isn't necessarily to pick all those up, but with VAR, the number of penalties and offences caused by, you know, non intentional handball. I know how do you say intent or whatever, but they've got to come up with a way to make it a little bit more. I mean, surely it's got to be something if the ball's going towards the goal rather than. If you know what I mean, if you're if you're playing a square pass or the pass is you're cutting back or whatever, and it, I mean, I don't know. Is, I, I'm, I, I, I'm I, I, that, but. I agree. I agree with you, right? So if it's if it's heading towards goal, you're stopping a goal to score a chance, then yeah, and and but all of that stuff then becomes way more subjective, and the laws of the game try and be black and white, and rightly so, right? You're trying to take some of the subjective subjectivity out of. It's bad enough with the way that the refs in VAR interpret interpret the rules as it currently stands, the more the more leeway you give them, the, the more inconsistency you're going to get, not less. So um, I get it, but I, I get your point. Like the, the whole hand to ball, ball to hand thing used to me was used to be a pretty good um, sort of baram- barometer and also like the arm in an unnatural position. So if, you're, if your arm's out here and you're stopping either a shot at goal or a cross coming into a dangerous area, you're asking for a you're asking for a pen there, for, but if it's just sort of bobbled about and your arms sort of hanging out where it should be and it sort of pops up and hits it, it's pretty hard. Also, yeah. sympathy for people who get hit at point blank range as well, because I mean, like, what's your reaction time like if you if you think you're able to stop it like from at two yards out? I mean, it's just it, it's almost like you're, you're playing off the guy off the defender. I, I, as a defender, I've got a certain amount of sympathy because. It's like your reaction time is not that not that super quick, but um, but yeah, as I said, I just it, I've said it for the last two seasons. It's just something that needs to be 
reviewed and it needs to, there needs to become some sort of consensus to try and just thin it down a bit. And another thing as well is that when's that yellow card and when's it not a yellow card? I still can't for yeah, life. I still me doesn't, yeah. I, I know what either. it's supposed to be, but it, it's not applied in any way that makes sense yeah, to me. No. Does that, I'm pretty sure there was, it was a Rangers player last week, handball, when he never got booked. And you're thinking, well, the, the time before that, it was a booking. And oh, yeah, so for me, that's the other thing, doesn't make any sense to me. So, but the, the, it's I mean, supposed we, to be we a yellow park, card we, we, if it's denying a promising attack. We can park, we can park this for another another time. So, yeah, the, 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 the rule is if you're not, not denying a goal scoring opportunity, but if you're impeding a positive, a, a potential attack, then it's supposed to be a yellow card. So unless you're basically unless it's moving away from goal, you know, being in the box is a right. That's why it's always a yellow card usually. Anyway, let's not go down that uh, rabbit one last, hole. One last, yeah. one last thing on on cards and felt. Do we think that the uh, Aberdeen fullback Mackenzie was a bit lucky? Like he did yeah. the straight, the left right. straight leg yeah. on on O'Reilly and O'Reilly. If O'Reilly does what her Hermonos or whatever you call him from um, yeah, exactly. Atletico the other week, if he sort of collapses the heap and rolls around like he's been shot. He's probably off, right? And yeah. and all O'Reilly does is take a step back and go, "What's what that?" Are you doing? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and he get. I don't think he even got booked for that. Um, mm, don't which... think he did either. No, he didn't. And, the, and the, keep, the, other, the goalkeeper, the, other... goal, the, the goalkeeper yeah, got booked for stuffing up the penalty spot. <laughs> that and was, that, I'm that assuming it. that that was either a linesman or it must have been. Well, you should have. Should have. Must be a linesman. Yeah. Yeah. It must be linesman. Must be linesman. Couldn't have seen it. The linesman, the linesman should have been in a position to see that when it was uh, being decided whether it was a penalty or not. Uh, yeah, but that's just unsportsmanlike behaviour. That's a yellow card. Uh, any final points on the the game, guys? Before we move on to man of the match, I was just going to say Bernabe came out of the cold to get a wee a wee run off the bench, so he's alive. Mm-hmm. Um, that's yeah, just, that was just an observation more than anything. I actually, but... I when I saw him on the bench, I actually thought, is he been lined up as a winger? As a mm. backup, that's what I. That's what my gut reaction was. It's like, oh, he's he's now a, he's a fill in on the left because obviously Mikey Johnson nowhere near the squad, um, and there's nobody else really around there that for that position. But then he came off, came on for 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 Taylor. He had a he had a half decent cameo. There was a couple of little nice little passes and um, a couple of a couple of long Boston runs it's just defending he can't do isn't it so it's true, he, wasn't yeah, really asked, yeah. he wasn't really asked to do that so great, great uh, but I actually struggles, genuinely great with, Taylor struggles with that as well at times well but, but I thought like honestly with Rome with Rome coming I thought oh maybe he's going to get 20 minutes it, as a left winger because you know we have yeah, got well, one the only other option is Rocco Vata isn't it? Well, I mean, it's Mark, Mark, the Marco Tellio other... where's Marco Tellio He's he played in a, a friendly two weeks ago, right? Wait, where's he's like weeks ago? That was longer ago than that. Or three, three ago, the last commentary, the last commentary, but I think it was about a month ago, and it was like a, it was a, um, was it a friendly or a um, testimonial or something? Yeah, that's um, what I'm talking about. That's the one. A child, yeah, so it's about a, at least a month ago. United. Yeah, yeah, and it was about at least a month. And the last commentary I just mentioned about Tilio, which is two or three weeks ago, and he said, "Oh, he's you know he's finding the step up from Australia quite." quite big which to me basically sounded like he was off the pace in training and if you're off the pace in training you're never going to get a jersey anytime soon so mm-hmm. uh he's he look he, there's a lot of Celtic fans writing him off and and obviously they don't have the 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 background knowledge we do so i can see why but um he's come out he's had a tough start right he comes here with an injury he misses basically all of pre-season he has to settle in all of that and then he's got like five or four or five six players ahead of him so but is this has got to be his opportunity over the next sort of you know the run into to the end of the year so he he wants to be getting himself fit in and on it asap because he's, he's going to play with australia under 23s uh this week right well, that's good and he was on the last international break as well he's he was selected mm. for that as well so he's clearly fit well well fit enough to be selected fit, maybe yeah not. in a sense yeah mm. paul hence else on the game uh, not in this game. There is a, one other football related thing yep, go I for it. to touch on. Um, just what, like, are you guys across what's going on in La Liga? Like, Girona, are, Girona, are top yeah, of, seen that. Top of the that. league. So, I just I did a little like, there's an article group. on the BBC. Yeah, it's a city, city group. Team. It's a city yeah, group it team. is a city group. So, I did, I, there's an article on this, um, on the BBC, and then I did a bit more digging. They are part of City Group, they've got a few players sort of loan, or they've bought players that used to be on loan. Um, but the thing that struck me was, uh, the two biggest signings came in this season, 
8 million euros each. So right in the sort of sweet spot, you would think two Ukrainians, striker and attacking midfielder. Um, they've got the majority of their goals and assists this season. Um, and I was, the wage bill's 52 million euros. And I was digging around that it isn't um, like their, their playing wage bill is 52 million euros. Oh, all right, okay. And so then it's hard to find this information on Celtic, but um, Alan Morrison, Celtic by numbers, I, I found something from the back end of last season, early this season, and he reckoned that our wage bill was around 49 million euros. So give or take the exact same position other than they play in La Liga, but they're a mm -hmm. tiny club in La Liga. And yes, the, you know, I don't want us to be part of the, the City group, but it sounds like... They've got a good coach, Michel. You you know, you guys are old enough to remember him when he played for Spain mm -hmm. and Real Madrid. Um, oh no, Raya, Raya, Vol Raya Volcano, I think he I thought he turned up at Madrid for, for a bit. But um he's the coach. And uh, yeah, got them, you know, got them playing some really good stuff. And I just thought, you know, that's where we should be kind of aiming for. If they, like, you know, they're only like what, 11, 13 games in. He's got them a few points clear of Real and Atletico and Barcelona. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. Like that's yeah, that's a good point. And we'll see and, how and they, look, the only thing dual, is obviously dual ownership well, goes in the Champions League next year. Yeah, like I just, obviously the old. Um, it's a long way to go to see if they end up in it, but you know, just the it's a lot more appealing to go to La Liga, even a small club in La Liga, than mm -hmm. it is probably to come to to Celtic like, for a few big games a year in the Champions League. But I don't know. I just felt like there was you know, it was an interesting enough story to fairy tale stuff, really. But it's something that we should be trying to. To sort of emulate do some kind of mirroring or emulation, uh, yeah, absolutely. It, if they step up a level, then we're going to probably become a feeder club for them because they'll become they'll be the feeder club for Man City and we'll be the feeder club for them. And then underneath us would be like New York, right? <laughs> uh, there, there's nobody else, Melbourne, in the city. Melbourne, 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 yeah, Melbourne exactly. City. Yeah, that's that's pretty much that's weird. There's a massive gap there, obviously, to us, or so we would like to think anyway. But it feels like we're going to be that, you know, as you mentioned, Paul, we should theoretically until until now have been level and as an attract an, uh, an attraction for players in, in terms to, to Girona. But if they step up, then that's going to be not the case. But yeah, it's a really good point, Paul. Well made. Uh, Anthony, anything else? Uh, no, just... Uh... No. No. Okay, let's do man of the match. Uh, Anthony, I think you started last week, so um, I'll stick my neck <laughs> this week. I don't think there'll be, I don't know if there'll be too many of the sentence. Actually, it was that people were saying I actually had two different players down for man of the match, and neither, and it was only when I thought about it afterwards that I was like, right, because because you know, I, I'm one of these people that's right, don't give players man of the match just because they scored goals, right? And obviously, Palma gets a goal and three assists. So my my automatic reaction after the game was that uh, that Yang or Matt O'Reilly were my two choices for man in a match, and then the more people were making the case for Palma, I was kind of like, oh, like there was he had some that cross, those two crosses were just real bits of class. He had that third one that you mentioned, Anthony, that nobody got in the end of. He just had these moments of class. He's very Beckham esque, and you're really tempted to give him it for just these moments that like make a difference in a game, but then. Yang was just really good, and Matt O'Reilly was just excellent through it. Like I, I had a little downturn in the second half, but he, and he changed position. And <sighs> honestly, and he had two assists. It's such a hard one. I'm actually going to give it to Yang. I'm going to say Yang after. And I, honestly, I wasn't. That wasn't deliberating for showmanship. That was. I was actually deliberating out loud. And I'm going to go with Yang. Set on Yang. So Anthony, you were first last week, so you can go last this week, Paul. It's the same three players, but uh, Yang's in bronze medal position for me. Um, obviously gets his goal and there's a couple of nice passes, but I was between the other two. Uh, and unlike you, I kind of do lean towards actual output. Um, but before I get to that, Matt, we haven't really touched on Matt Riley other than a little tiny bit there. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, from his control, pulling balls out of the sky, first touch was immaculate passing movement uh like you said two assists the, the 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 reverse ball while he's fallen over to put owen you know the game's done at that mm -hmm. point um but that ball is absolutely weighted perfectly oh doesn't have to break stride and then he's in and it's a great finish as well like let's be honest oh, oh took his goals really well and really pleased for him obviously i've been a, a bit of an advocate for him and uh, you know one of the 
kind of more lone voices in the support for a while, like try to keep him, you know, keep up a bit of positivity about him. So, um, you know, nice little cameo by him. O'Reilly, absolutely brilliant. But I am going to give it to Palmer. Um, three assists, a goal, a few other close calls and, and you know, decent bits of service. It's, a, it's, it's his best performance in a shirt, selling shirt for me. And it, yeah, he's, he's my man of the match. Anthony? Palmer. Um, oh. <laughs> he uh, no, no, Matt, no, no. In fairness, Matt O'Reilly had a really good game, and he ran him the closest out of everybody. Um, but and so O'Reilly ended up with two assists. But just the the moments that Palmer had in the game seemed to stick in my mind. Uh, and as much as the eye test is the output test, it's like well, on paper, yes, he scored, had his assists, but like it was done in quite spectacular fashion as well. And football is meant to be the beautiful game so as much as it's like yes david tumble scored a goal whatever but it's like who appeals to the eye and who gets you up out your seat and he's not jota but he's something else and i'm very very glad that we signed him because i think there's a definitely a player there and the way he strikes the ball uh, that i like it I, I just i like the way he whips his crosses in i like the way he takes his shots the fact that he can do it with both feet um, I think we've got we've done we've done some good business there, and I think there's hopefully more to come. So yeah, good performance, great performance by him, and worthy man of the match. And so grateful yeah. that he he rejected the team from across the city. <laughs> well, let's face it; they probably put an inquiry in, and they went, uh, "We'll pay you in ginger uh, bottles, stamps, stamps, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> empty <laughs> iron brew bottles, oh, poppies." I need we'll to I need poppies. to make I need to make a a pastic of the the natural novel book remember he, he brought out a book that was like uh i said no thanks or something on it and uh i can't remember what the title was whereas for uh palma he'll do a book that'll be like uh sevco said no thanks <laughs> <laughs> and then which i guess is the john hartson story all over again right but yeah yeah anyway yeah so uh by by majority palma man in a match uh any final thoughts guys uh unrelated to the game before we sign off Anthony? well i'm happy that the sag afro strike has finally resolved itself so the actors are back in the in the, the movie studios the tv studios making content for us all it was looking a bit bleak there for a while but they've managed to strike a deal that involves them not being turned into ai puppets Mm -hmm. so uh so that's good and uh i watched the season finale loki this week oh, I think it's the no series spoilers. finale no spoilers no, but it was i'm not seeing any of it fantastic it was probably one of the most satisfying endings to a you know when you usually you watch series and they never stick the landing like the final episode is such a letdown no this was this built up to this and it's actually over the two seasons builds up to this and mm. yeah actually really really good ending so um for once um yeah managed to stick the landing so not really enjoyable so i just re highly recommend that it's only six episodes per season so it's easy to binge it except oh. you need to remind yourself what happened in season one because it was so mind bending yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I'm going to do a music rec uh, recommendation. I'm going to go, um, this is a bit of a weird one because it's a bit that I usually do current. Um, I'm going to give you a random throwback uh, album from 2018 that I've stumbled upon and been listening to in the last uh, week or so. Um, artists I really like, Malcolm Middleton, one half of um, Arab Strap for uh, people that know them, Scottish, obviously. Um, it's his 2018 album called Bananas. Um, couple of, just a couple of song titles just to show you that this, this guy's a bit quirky. Uh, favorite song of the album love is a momentary lapse in self-loathing and uh, buzz lightyear helmet is another track of the album so yeah if you if you like a bit of adam strap and or um malcolm middleton's other um uh solo material and you may or may not have stumbled upon his 2018 album bananas give it a listen um on your usual streaming services cracking album hmm. uh, i watched the latest spider-man movie have you guys seen it I was Is that the, anima the animated one? Yeah, the animated one. Uh, I haven't I was, seen it yet. No. Uh, just, I'll give you a heads up then. It's not a spoiler. Uh, that is actually part one of a two-part movie. And they don't advertise it as such, so I didn't know. And then when it gets to the end, then it's just like to be continued. I was like, are you... I was, I was so angry. <laughs> I was like... Is this part like, of like the Spider-Verse? Like, yeah. yeah. Is it, yeah. Saga thing? All that, all that stuff? Yeah. I'm not Multiple spider, spider people. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, what well, you're mentioning about Loki yeah. there, there's literally zero resolution at the end of the movie because it's it's a to be continued, right? They just like they drop it, you know, just whatever. You'll, you'll, you'll get the answer in a bit two years time, Sean. So uh, animation so takes a while. So angry. <laughs> so, anyway, maybe they did it so, all. Maybe did they? They maybe they did it all at one go and just split it up. That would be a. That would I don't be think so. Those those movies are very very uh, time uh, intensive. So yeah, with animation, you might be yeah. waiting a while for that. Yeah. They're, they're really Sorry. beautiful movies and they're funny and everything. They are well done, but I was just there yeah. and then just, oh, just it just it, it, it crumbled my biscuits. I was annoyed. Um, anyway, uh, I think that's all for this. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, please do all the social stuff: like, subscribe, follow. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I've had one follower, new two new followers in the last week. Yay! Uh, if anyone else wants to follow me, please feel free to. Uh, X now, I guess. Uh, other than that, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll be see back you in after, two weeks. Yeah, yeah, after the international break. Uh, hail, 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 hail. hail.